Good morning. Good to see those of you who are here this morning. Uh, let's just worship the Lord this morning as we get started. Dan's going to come on up and give some announcements, so you guys can have a seat for a minute.
than one day. I'll cross that
Won't you just pray with me? Lord, we do look to you. You are our God. You are our Savior. You are our friend. Lord, you lead us through the hard times. You don't uh, walk away from us, but just uh, take our hand and carry us when we need to. Lord, we just thank you that you uh, lead us along still waters. You have us rest in green pastures. You restore our soul. Lord, we just thank you for all that you do for us on a daily basis. We pray that we would uh, look to you now, that we would open our hearts to your truth that we would let it change those parts of us that are, we're holding on to and uh, just staying stubborn with. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to know you, to have salvation through your son, Jesus Christ, in his name, amen. Those of you who are about sixth grade and under, if you're ready to head back for Children's Church, your teachers will meet you in the back. Everybody else can have a seat. Those of you who are still here, you can grab your Bibles and open with me to John chapter 11 today. John chapter 11. So there's a story about a young man who was extremely excited because he had just won a ticket to the Super Bowl. I mean, we would all be excited about that, wouldn't we? But his excitement kind of lessened a little bit when he realized that his seat was way up in the nosebleed section, about as far up as you could get in the stadium. And, and so he decided that he would look around, see if there's any empty seats. Yeah, right, empty seats at the Super Bowl. But he searched, as he searched for empty seats, he found one way down low, just a few rows up from the field. And so he left his seat and walked on down and approached the man sitting next to the empty seat and asked him if the seat was taken. And the man replied, well, no, it's not. Amazed, the young man said, well, how could someone pass up a seat like this? And the older gentleman responded, well, that's my wife's seat. We've been to every Super Bowl together since the day we were married. But she's passed away this year. How sad, the young man said. I'm sorry, so much sorry, sorry for your loss, but, but certainly couldn't you have found a friend or a relative to, to come with you? No, the man said. They're all at the funeral. <laughs> hmm. Priorities, right? <laughs> well, funerals really are not laughing matters. They're generally a time of tears and grieving. Yes, sometimes there's some laughter as we share some stories and so forth from, uh, in remembrance of the uh, individual. I've been to a few funerals myself, probably average around five or six a year, or maybe more some years. Jesus went to a funeral in John chapter 11, a funeral of a very dear friend, dear friend named Lazarus. He was actually late, not just a little bit late, four days late to this funeral. Now, in Jewish custom, funerals took place normally very quickly following death, sometimes the very same day, in fact, but certainly within a day or two. After the family prepared the body, family and friends would then carry the body from the home to the funeral, in a funeral procession to the grave site. And, uh, and then following the burial of the body, the family would return home in another procession back to the home. And, and the family would stay there for at least a week, uh, a seven-day, week-long period of grieving. And during that week-long period of grieving, many friends and family would simply drop by and grieve along with them and offer their condolences. So it was, it was a process. Well, Jesus missed the funeral procession. But he arrived during that week of grieving on the fourth day. But when Jesus arrived, this funeral took a very interesting turn, one that no one would ever forget. John chapter 11, we're going to look at verses 1 through 44 today, entitled the message, Raising Lazarus. And that's exactly what he does. This passage, as we work our way through it, includes the fifth I am statement of Jesus in the Gospel of John the seventh miraculous sign that John recorded in his gospel to demonstrate the deity of Christ and to encourage people to believe in Jesus. But it also includes the shortest verse in the Bible. So lots of things in this passage. We're just going to walk our way through the narrative. But as we do, we'll stop and look at some of those highlights along the way in a little bit more depth. So we start off in verses 1 through 16. Jesus delays healing Lazarus. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. 
He is from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. But Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to the disciples, let us go up to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he's sleeping, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. That is with Jesus, not with Lazarus. <laughs> Let us go that we may die with him. So, first thing we need to know is there are actually two men in the Bible named Lazarus. One is mentioned, and it's interesting that both of them are mentioned in the context of their death. One is mentioned in Luke chapter 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, both died. Uh, Lazarus went to heaven, the rich man went to hell. And so it's a story in Luke 16 of uh, this conversation that takes place, uh, particularly from the rich man begging that Lazarus might be able to go back. And, but Jesus said, uh, said no. Well, the Lazarus we see in John chapter 11 is a different Lazarus. He's not a beggar, but he's the brother of Mary and Martha. And he's the one who became ill. Now, we don't know where Jesus was when he received word of Lazarus' um, illness. He had left Jerusalem at the end of chapter 10, if you recall, uh, after his encounter with the religious leaders, and they tried to stone him. Uh, he, may, he, he went from Jerusalem then on down to the, the Jordan River where John had been baptizing, although John had already, was already dead as well. But he went back there, and he may have gone from there back to Galilee, back to Capernaum, or he may just simply be over on the east side of the Jordan River in Perea. But he's at least a distance away uh, from, from Bethany. So in verse 3, Mary and Martha send word to Jesus that their brother Lazarus was ill. I'm sure they were simply hoping that he would come and heal him before he died, so he wouldn't die. It's interesting that in verse in this verse, they refer to Lazarus as the one you love. And they use the word phileo there for love, which speaks of a brotherly, affectionate love. This is a friend of Jesus. The word agape is used then in verse 5, speaking where Jesus says, where it says Jesus loved all three, Mary, Martha, and uh, Lazarus as well. It kind of uses those words sometimes interchangeably, but these people are friends of Jesus. He'd probably been in their home on several occasions. Now, while Lazarus was not one of the 12 disciples, he certainly is a dear friend. Verse four, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. And yet he died, right? We'll see that later. But it's important, we, well, actually we see that in this passage, but it's important to notice that Jesus didn't actually say he would not, the sickness would not end in death. But, it would, but he's going to end in the glory of God. The word end is actually not in the Greek word there, in the Greek, trans, Greek language, but it simply translates a preposition. Preposition speaking, uh, usually translated to or toward. And so literally it says the sickness is not to death. The preposition is a preposition of direction. Uh, illness is leading to something, directing to something. Well, if you put it in the context, though, it, it could be, leading to a place, to an event, to a time, to a result, to, an, to a purpose, something anyway. But if you put it in a context, it's clearly speaking of the purpose of Lazarus' death, his illness. Rather than ending, rather than a result of death, the sickness is not intended for death, but it's intended for the glory of God. And we're going to see very clearly that this is a death that 
results in the glory of God. So let's stop for a minute, though. Uh, before continuing, and consider the purpose of man. It just said that Lazarus' death is going to end in the glory of God. The Westminster Shorter, Shorter Catechism, Confession of Faith, begins with the very first question that says, what is the chief end of man? And it answers the question, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So our end, our goal, our ultimate purpose in life is to bring glory to God. On a macro basis, the theme of the Bible is the glory of God. Now, many times people suggest that the theme of the Bible is salvation. I always suggest that it's bigger than that. It's the glory of God. See, God is certainly glorified through salvation, which demonstrates his love and his mercy and his grace. But God is ultimately glorified through judgment as well, which demonstrates his holiness and his justice. So whichever result is, God is glorified. That's the ultimate goal of everything in the universe, the glory of God. In the Bible, the theme of the Bible is the glory of God. But let's bring it down to more of a micro level, a personal level. Your purpose, my purpose in life is also to glorify God. Whether in great times, in times of turmoil, times of abundance, times of poverty, in good health, in bad health, in pain, even in death, as with Lazarus. The ultimate purpose in all of life is the glory of God. Now, the word to glorify simply means to, to show off God, to, to make God look good, to, to esteem God. Unfortunately, we get a lot of things backwards in life, don't we? And, and it seems that in our world today, everyone is seeking to glorify who? Themselves. Glorify me, my, you know, myself all the time. We want to show ourselves off. We want to make ourselves look good. You, you think about when you put together a resume, you put all the pluses on there so you can make yourself look really good, right? Well, what about making God look really good in life? At Planet Fitness, where I work out occasionally. What are you laughing about? That wasn't the joke. Come on. Oh, the word occasionally. You want to know how often I work out, right? We'll keep you guessing. But anyway, they have signs posted uh, with sayings to encourage people. Like uh, a lot of signs just kind of encouraging you, like... The word, one of the signs says, you belong. But one of the signs that I've seen it says this, in the end, it's all about you. And every time I see that sign, I always want to kind of cut out the word God and go paste it over the word you. Because no, in the end, it's not all about you. In the end, it's all about God. He's the one to be glorified. Life is not all about you or me. Life is all about God and his glory. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, even exercising, do it all to the glory of God. Everything to the glory of God. So that's your purpose, my purpose, to glorify God in all we do. Well, in verse 6, we'll, we'll go on. Jesus delayed going to Bethany for a couple days. Why? So that God would be glorified even through death, even through Lazarus' death and his eventual resurrection from the dead. So then in verses 7 through 10, after a couple of days, Jesus is ready to go to Bethany, to the home of Lazarus. But the disciples object, reminding Jesus that there are wanted posters all over Jerusalem with his face posted on it, because the religious leaders want him dead. They don't want anything to do with Jesus. But Jesus says, there are only 12 hours of daylight in a day. That's, that's uh, might be a little confusing for us, but there's probably a Hebrew proverb or Hebrew saying that simply means there's only a limited amount of time in any given day to do all of your work. So we'd best be about getting our work done. So it's kind of a figurative way of simply referring to the time allotted by the Father for the earthly work of Jesus to get done. There's a limited time remaining, Jesus is saying, so we need to be about the Father's work. So let's go. Let's go. Verses 11 through 13, Jesus tells his disciples that Lazarus has fallen asleep. Sleep, if you read through scripture, you'll find that the word sleep is often used to refer to physical death. 
The disciples thought, in fact, that Jesus was referring to physical sleep and that Lazarus would eventually wake up, get well and wake up. But Jesus clarifies very clearly and makes it very clear that Lazarus has, in fact, died. And then he says again, I'm glad I wasn't there so that God can be glorified. So let's go. Now, Thomas, you remember Thomas? He's the, we often call, call him the doubter, right? The skeptic in the crowd. But notice his devotion to Jesus comes out very clearly here in, in verse 16. He is ready to die with Jesus. He's that devoted to Jesus. You ready to die for Jesus? Are you that devoted to Jesus? Well, we go on. Jesus goes, and the first thing he does when he gets to Bethany is he comforts Lazarus' sisters. Beginning with, um, well, let's, let's just start reading here. Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of of their brother. So Bethany is just a suburb, really, of Jerusalem, just a couple miles across the Kidron Valley, about a three-day journey from Galilee, if Jesus was up in Capernaum in Galilee. It's about a three-day journey, uh, but probably just a one-day journey from Perea. But whichever case, wherever Jesus was, when he finally arrived in Bethany, he found that Lazarus had been dead for four days. So the first thing Jesus does is he comforts the sisters, beginning with Martha, verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. So Jesus starts off by comforting Martha. Now, Mary and Martha are pretty typical. They're just like you and me. They're grieving their brother's death. They're very sad. They're grief-stricken. And yet Jesus deals with them very tenderly. No rebukes, no disappointments with them. He simply listens, he empathizes, he encourages, and he assures them. Verse 20 to 21, Martha is the first one to see Jesus, went outside the house because she heard that Jesus was coming and so went out to meet him and met him even at the, before he got into the city. And her very first words reveal her profound faith in Jesus. He says, had you been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus could have healed her brother. Never thought that he might raise, her from, raise him from the dead, but he, she knew that he could heal her, heal him. So Jesus assured Martha that her brother would, in fact, rise again. That's a statement that probably has a, a double meaning, doesn't it? Both physical and spiritual, immediate and eternal. In verse 24, Martha understood the spiritual meaning of resurrection. She was certain that her brother would, in fact, experience resurrection in the end, at, at the last day. But she didn't quite catch the immediate significance that Jesus was going to raise him from the dead that day. Verse 25 through 26, Jesus responds to her and says, I am the resurrection and the life. So let's stop there and let's kind of look at that highlight. That is the fifth I am statement of Jesus in the book of John. He's already said, I'm the bread of life, I'm the light of the world, I am the door, I'm the good shepherd. Now he says, I am the resurrection and the life. <clears throat> he goes on and he employs a, a play on words here to discuss life and death. Just as Jesus uses the word life many times to refer to both the either physical life or spiritual life or eternal life, he also uses the word death to refer to physical death or spiritual death. Physical death is usually described as a separation of my soul from my body. You know, my physical body dies, my soul leaves my physical body. 
Spiritual death then is defined as separation of man from God as a result of sin. And the only remedy to spiritual death is to pass from death to life through Jesus Christ. If not remedied, then the result will be eternal death, separation from God forever, eternally. Now, if you read through verse 25 through 26, it kind of sounds a little bit confusing when you first read it. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Doesn't that sound a little bit confusing? But if you employ those, the meanings of those two words, both senses of living and death, it, it really goes like this. He who believes in me will live spiritually, even though he dies physically. And whoever lives physically and believes in me will never die spiritually. Makes a lot of sense when you see the double meanings of those words, doesn't it? But it's interesting here. Jesus didn't say that he was going to give life or give resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the only one, or Jesus is the one with power and authority over life and death and resurrection. He is resurrection and life. To know Jesus is to know resurrection and life. And he also employed the ego a me formula, which simply is the designation for Yahweh in the Old Testament. We've talked about that with each of the previous four I am statements. He's basically saying, I am God, Yahweh. So what we see from this very clearly, once again, is that Jesus is in fact deity. Only God has the authority over life and death. And yet Jesus says, I have the authority over life and death. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is clearly deity. Add to that that he uses again the I am formula. He is the resur I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is clearly claiming to be God. He is deity. And then he asks Martha, do you believe? And Martha responds with a tremendous confession of faith. Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah. You are the promised one, the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who came from the Father to earth. She believes. And then Martha runs and tells her sister Mary that Jesus is here. Mary then leaves to see Jesus. So Jesus comforts Mary again as well, beginning in verse 28. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Well, come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So when Mary leaves the house, her guests follow her, thinking that she's on her way to the tomb, which was pretty customary to go back to the tomb and the whole grieving process uh, during that week as well. And they eventually did go to the tomb. But first of all, she went to see Jesus. And the first thing she said when she saw Jesus is exactly the same thing that her sister Martha had said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So Mary too expresses her faith in Jesus. Still grieving, still grieving the loss of her brother, but simply expressing her faith in the Lord. So in verses 33 through 34, again, we see that Jesus doesn't rebuke her. He listens to her. He comforts her. And then he even asks to go to the grave with her. And then we come to verse 35. Jesus wept. He shed tears. He cried. The shortest verse in the Bible. It's often quoted somewhat jokingly. You probably heard it quoted like that. 
When people are asked, hey, do you know any Bible verses? The first one they usually say is, oh, yeah, John 11:35. 35, Jesus wept. Why do they say that? Because it's short. And everybody's got that one memorized. You all have it memorized, right? John 11:35. what's it say? There you go. See, you got, the ver- you got a Bible verse memorized. Whether you're good at memorization or not, you got that one down pat. But even though it's short, it is packed with significant truth. Jesus here is entering into the grief of Martha and Mary. He's grieving the death of a friend. The crowd in verse 36 is spot on. Jesus loved Lazarus, and so he wept. He shed some tears. He's crying. He's grieving. The point is simply this. Jesus is human. And that is a significant theological truth. Jesus has emotions. He feels just like any other human being. He loves, he grieves, he hurts, he cares, he feels, just like you and I feel. So he's not only deity, he is human as well. As man, as human, that simply means that Jesus gets us. He understands you and me. He can relate to our hurt, to our pain. He can relate to your feelings, to your emotions. He understands the pain of ridicule and rejection, doesn't he? He gets it. He understands your grief and your sorrow, as we see here. Yes, Jesus is deity, but he's also human. He is the perfect God-man. And when I say that, it doesn't say that I'm not saying that he's half God and half man. Not at all. We'll never think that. He is fully God, 100% God, and fully human, 100% human. Do I understand that? No, I'm not God. I don't understand these kinds of things. But that's what the Bible teaches. He's fully God, fully human, the perfect God man. And so we see in this passage both his deity, I am the resurrection and the life, and his humanity, Jesus wept. Well, as God, he then raises Lazarus from the dead. Verses 38 through 44. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. What a scene, huh? Wouldn't you like to have been there for that one? Boy, I sure would have been. So verses 39 through 40, Jesus first says, hey, roll the stone away. Of course, Martha objects. Oh, Lord, he's been dead for four days. Come on, he's, he's already starting to smell, okay? We don't want to take the stone away. That odor is just going to... Anyway. Jesus responds and says, I said, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So they roll the stone away. Twice it's been emphasized that Lazarus has been dead for four days. There must be something significant about four days, right? And there is. Not only does the body begin to decompose on the fourth day, but in the Mishnah, Mishnah is a record of a lot of Jewish traditions and Jewish um, thinking and beliefs, we actually find a rabbinic belief that the soul remained near the corpse of the dead person for three days, hoping to re-enter the body. That's what they believed. Is that true? No. But that's what they believed. But by the fourth day, they said, when the body began to decompose, well, the soul gave up and departed for good. Now, Jesus had raised a couple other people from the dead, like the daughter of Jairus, But they were all resurrected on the same day they died, okay? So, no big deal, right? Well, yeah, it is a big deal because we know that the soul departs right away. 
But this resurrection is four days later. And Lazarus is wrapped in burial clothes, placed in a grave, decomposing, smelling. According to Jewish tradition, the soul had departed for good. And so if we were to put miracles on a Richter scale of 1 to 10, like we do for earthquakes, bringing someone back to life on the same day of death would probably register about a 9.9, maybe even a 10.0. But to raise someone after being dead for four days, that's like off the charts, okay? That's impossible, humanly speaking. Well, any resurrection is, humanly speaking. But what a miracle. This is like the miracle of all miracles. Verses 41 through 44, Jesus did just that. He did the impossible, the humanly impossible, because he is, in fact, the resurrection and the life. First, the text says he prayed, and then he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come on out. Now, why did he call out? Why did he have to shout? Well, obviously, the guy's dead, so he can't hear him anybody shouting when you're dead, right? So he had to shout, Lazarus, come out. Well, no, I don't care how dead you are and how loud you can shout, dead people aren't going to hear your loud shout. So he didn't shout for the sake of Lazarus. He's shouting here for the sake of the people around him. He's speaking with authority, even authority over the dead, over death. And then, amazingly, Lazarus comes walking out of the grave with all of his grave clothes on, linens wrapped around his body, his face wrapped in a cloth, kind of mummy-like, walking out of the grave, okay? And so Jesus told him to unwrap him, take the grave clothes off, and and free him. Now, i got to stop and think here. What would Lazarus be thinking here, okay? What? Why am I back here? Jesus, you did what? Come on, I was enjoying heaven and you brought me back here to earth? Thanks a lot, Jesus. You know, really, what in the world are you doing? I'm sure that Jesus and Lazarus probably had a little sidebar discussion here. Uh, You had to explain a few things to him, right? Don't, Don't you think so? But what a miracle. And this is the seventh sign. So let's stop and think about that seventh sign for a moment. I find it very interesting. I don't want to make much of this, but I just kind of find it interesting that Jesus began his public ministry with the first miracle at a wedding. And he ends his public ministry with this seventh sign at a funeral. Weddings and funerals. (laughs) Hmm. The first sign, he turned water into wine, which demonstrated Jesus' power over time kind of bypass that whole fermentation process, just turn the water straight into wine, okay? Second sign, second miracle, was a long-distance healing where, he dim- where Jesus healed uh, an official's uh, child from 20 miles away, which demonstrates Jesus is not bound by space. The third and sixth signs, he healed two blind men, which demonstrates his power over disease. The fourth and fifth signs, Feeding the 5,000 and walking on water demonstrated his power over nature. But this seventh sign demonstrates Jesus' authority and power over life and death. This sign truly is off the scales on the Richter scale of miracles. This is like the pinnacle of miraculous signs. So, you would think that all the people would be in awe and they would believe, immediately believe in Jesus, right? Right? How do they respond? Come back next week. We'll talk about their response. So in this chapter, in this section here, we've discussed the fifth I am statement. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is truly God. We discussed the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept, which tells us he is also human. He's a perfect God man. And now we discussed the seventh sign, the seventh miracle that John records. Um, not to bring glory to himself, but clearly to bring glory to God the Father. And God, through this, glorifies his son, Jesus, as well. So let's put it all together. What, what's, what's the bottom line here? What does all this mean? The point, I think, is simply this. Jesus is Lord over life and death. Jesus is Lord over life and death. 
Jesus is the one who gives life, whether physical life or spiritual life. He's also the one who sustains life. He's the one who determines the days of our lives, which means he's Lord over death as well. He's the one who gives spiritual life and raises us to eternal life with the Father. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is Lord over life and death. Now, the resurrection of Lazarus is a miracle. certainly foreshadows the resurrection of Jesus himself from the grave, which would occur just a few weeks later. A few short weeks after raising Lazarus, Jesus would, in fact, himself die and rise from the grave as well, conquering sin, conquering Satan, conquering the last enemy, death itself. He rose victoriously himself. The Lazarus resurrection is also a foreshadowing of our own resurrection. We too will rise in the last day. We too will rise to spiritual life and eternal life. We will experience a resurrection ourselves to eternal life in heaven. Jesus' resurrection guarantees that. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live spiritually and eternally even though he dies physically. And whoever lives physically will never die spiritually. But then he turned to Martha and said, do you believe? So I would ask you the same question today. Do you believe? Do you believe it? Do you believe in Jesus? A perfect God-man? Do you believe? Do you believe that he is the source of life and death? Is the Lord over life and death? Well, if so, if you believe in Jesus, then you need not fear death because you will experience life and resurrection because Jesus is life and resurrection. To know Jesus is to know life and resurrection. Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, for your word and just the Tremendous demonstration of who Jesus is, both human but God. Thank you, Lord. And thank you that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And even as he raised Lazarus, Lord, we rejoice that he raised himself. He rose from the grave, conquering sin, conquering death, conquering Satan himself. Lord, thank you that through his resurrection, we have assurance of our own resurrection, our own life as well. Thank you, Father. So we just rejoice today in that resurrection. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's stand and celebrate resurrection, resurrection of Jesus, okay? Risen out of the darkness, risen beyond the grave, risen. Jesus, your name we praise, Jesus, out of the darkness, risen beyond the grave, risen forever, holy Jesus, your name we praise. We lift your name high, proclaim it day and night, shout it far and wide, for you are alive. We lift your name high, proclaim it day and night, shout it Yeah.
Amen. You are dismissed. Go with the Lord.